Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is John Robb, thinker and writer about global level systems, strategies, and conflicts. His main platform these days is Global Gorillas on Patreon. If you like his work, please support him on Patreon. I do. He's a voice worth having. So, John, uh, the reason I reached out to you initially for this uh, brief uh, second visit to our extra COVID-19 episodes uh, was a tweet that you made the other day, which I'll read. One of the most lasting effects of the pandemic, question mark, the accelerated emergence of the new political spectrum, network consensus versus network dissent. Could you say some more about that? Yeah, um, one of the things I've been writing about for a long while um, is the emergence of a new decision-making system, a new social decision-making system um, that can you know, over time, as we kind of get our arms around it, complement the other social decision-making systems that we have. Um, you know, we have tribalism, which is nationalism. We have bureaucracy and we have markets. And we've tamed them, more or less, uh, over the last uh, five centuries um, to effectively allow us a, or to deal with environmental challenges. And um, now that we're in a global environment, a complex global environment, where the threats have become more difficult to deal with. Uh, it seems like that you know the threats are exceeding our capacity to make effective decisions using the old methods, and uh, we need a new one. This network decision making, but you know, trying to figure out what it can be good for and what it what it uh, is bad at it will take some time. Uh, the model that I've developed and that I've uh, you know teased out of what I've seen is that this network. Uh, one of the key decision-making systems that, that's falling out of it is this idea of the consensus and dissent. Um, and the consensus is an agreement on a very simple proposition. And uh, it allows society to move very quickly once it agrees on that uh, proposition. Um, and the dissent is this uh, very similar to what you see with, you know, a lot of what Trump does. It's always finding kind of the opposite view and, and trying to uh, disrupt through, you know, different means the the consensus, a consensus that from the outside appears to be uh, detrimental to the health and well-being of the people who are dissenting. So in the case of, uh, it, in the situation we're in right now with the, the pandemic, we see a very clear example of, of a consensus uh, developing in terms of, you know, this pandemic is bad and, and that we should eradicate it. And it developed very, very quickly. And then it allowed the shutdown of the, the entire U.S. economy to occur within weeks, uh, long before the governments actually even got to the point where they were starting to order shutdowns. So the consensus actually you know, shut down air travel, even though there really isn't any restrictions on air travel. Now it's down 96% from where it was. Um, it has shut down commerce. It changed corporate behavior you know, through pressure, both demand pressure plus internal kind of uh, social pressure to force people to, you know, or to force uh, companies to uh, opt for work at home, uh, corporate travel. Um, et cetera. And then, um, then now we have the dissent is the group of people on the outside who are saying, let's, let's open up the economy now. Uh, the pandemic is overstated, uh, that it's a lot of the information is faked or the goalposts are moving or um, that we should go through with a herd immunity strategy. So that kind of dynamic between dissent and consensus is how we're making decisions now. Yeah, it's very, very right. I love the point that you make that uh, in some sense, the social distancing, at least the wave started uh, before the government 
uh, acted. You know, for instance, you know, I read the signals and concluded that for myself and my family, uh, we were locking the fuck down around the 5th of March, right? Uh, long before right. any state yeah. did it. Uh, and so, and so I was an incremental network signal and I passed that word along to my friends and, uh, and to, to at least to some degree on social media. And, and so the network itself started at least parts of it coalesced around the consensus. Uh, and, you know, I might have been wrong, but I had a person who had just had major surgery uh, and is in the elevated age range, it struck me as uh, a, a reasonable response. Uh, but whether oh, yeah. it was a globally correct response or not, hard to say. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, it did a lot of things. It did, you know, there was an open source information discovery effort. Um, I mean, there's more information flowing, you know, torrent of information flowing. Um, on, on the pandemic uh, in comparison to kind of the black box, kind of the black box trickle that we got in, in previous events, it, you know, and this information is constantly being vetted. It's being torn apart, reassembled. Um, new strategies are being produced. Uh, information is then, you know, turned into knowledge and, and, you know, insight that the consensus puts into play. Um, it's, it's been a pretty amazing process to watch. You know, and given that it's really truly early days, I mean, you know, the consensus idea stretches back to the big open source protests that we saw uh, back in, you know, the Arab Spring all the way up through. We saw it just recently, we saw it in Puerto Rico where they toppled the governor of Puerto Rico um, coming together over a single idea. Uh, so these, these a consensus can mobilize very, very quickly and, and it can, you know, undertake an incredible information discovery effort and it can implement and act on that in a, in a very complex way, um, you know, far faster, I think, than, than you know, the old traditional government can. Um, but there's also a need for the dissent. And if you have too much dissent, it seems chaotic. In the last three years or so, you know, with, with Trump in power, it felt more chaotic than, than stable. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should not have the dissent because a consensus can get locked in. And we're gonna find that out uh, going out of this, trying to get out of this lockdown is that it's going to be very hard to get people out of the kind of siege mentality that developed as part of this consensus. And that the dissent is one of the keys to kind of getting us out of that, um, you know, constantly arguing in favor of moving the economy forward. But, there, you know, we're going to have to figure out other ways to, to break out of the, this, uh, this lock-in achieved by the consensus. Yeah, it's interesting. And uh, we, as we were chatting uh, prior to the, to the going live on the show, you made the very good point that uh, in fact, why did you make the point about the attributes of this particular virus and how it's kind of a uh, perhaps a challenge for network sense making? Yeah, um, this virus is just like this perfectly designed instrument for you know, sitting astride, just, you know, obvious need for a complete lockdown if it was really, really, truly deadly up to 20, 30 percent uh, or, um, you know, just letting it go through with, with a kind of a herd immunity strategy. You know, it, it targets a very specific subgroup. So most people under 50 are, are not really impacted that, that much. Um, and that gives a, you know, a false sense of, of, of kind of uh, immunity to the, to the effects of the virus. Um, and then it requires a, you know, incredible investment in time to kind of eradicate it with, you know, two weeks of quarantine and the necessity of doing that early and, Oh, what else about this? Uh, I had a whole brief that I wrote up on this, that, that you know, this, the design of this virus, it makes it really, really effective. Um, and then the, uh, the speed of transmission is, is absolutely insanely high. I mean, it's up in smallpox territory, according to some estimates, um, exceeding smallpox, less than chickenpox. Um, so uh, it can, you know, get out of control very, very easily and, and, and zoom to, you know, population scale. Uh, levels. Um, yeah, it makes decision making on this very, very hard. And, and you were mentioning that it was between these two valleys. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to see us kind of grapple with that. It made it incredibly hard for the government to make decisions um, because it's really not clear exactly what strategy, exit strategy or response strategy is the best. Do you do full quarantine or you do, do, do you do kind of a big tech uh, testing uh, regime? Uh, to kind of stabilize the situation, or do you go with herd immunity? And I've been evaluating all three of those, and I've kind of come to a conclusion on that. But um, 
we can get to that. That's in a your conclusion. I know you you wrote recently about the Swedish experiment with herd immunity. Yeah. Um, well, one of the themes that we see in the in the dissent is that uh, herd immunity is probably better as a strategy because you know shutting down the economy for months at a time is is just not sustainable. It's caused more damage long term than than suffering through a couple hundred thousand dead. And um, so I went in and I looked at kind of the exemplar of the, of the strategy, Sweden, and I found out that they were really very similar to what, what we see in, in many states, ex- with a couple exceptions, is that they um, have not closed elementary schools and activities. So there is a transmission vector, but you know, the evidence is that the elementary school kids don't carry high viral load, so it probably isn't as big of a vector as you would get if you had universities that are still open. Um, and that they led to bars and restaurants stay open. But the bulk of the, the actual you know, mitigation of the virus is all being done by, through social distancing. And, and Sweden is really quite good at social distancing. I mean, there's always a joke about, you know, I, I saw a pretty interesting uh, uh, joke about that is that if you want to really experience loneliness, you know, stand in a bus line in, in Sweden because everyone's six to seven feet away from each other. But um, I started looking at, you know, what the impact of just letting this roll through the population and assuming that you can using social distancing and, 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 and selective government efforts to kind of mitigate the effects to keep the level of people who are sick below the level of the capacity of the health system. Because um, the, the strategy and the herd immunity strategy is that you, as long as you can care for these people effectively using the healthcare system, uh, you'll let it run as hot as possible for as long as possible until you, you achieve herd immunity status. And what that means is typically for something that's the respiratory virus that's highly transmissible, somewhere between 80 and 95% of the population has to get it and recover from it and have some kind of internal immunity. And there, evidence suggests that there is, uh, you do get a, become immune if you um, recover from it. Now, that strategy, and as I looked around the world and found out or found uh, where the virus is having the most impact is that it works and it probably will work in relatively young countries. And I mean, with their median age of less than 30. And that it proves to be deadly in countries where the median age is greater than 30. And you have the places where the the virus is having the the most uh, deleterious impact is in the old developed countries, you know, old sick developed countries, the fragile countries of, you know, China and uh, the U.S. and Europe, you know, median age is 38, 38, and 42 in the EU. Um, a lot of really, really old populations um, are, and what the virus did is it turned our healthcare system, which is our, you know, considered our strength, and one of our key strengths, um, into a weakness, a weakness so so big that it, you know, made us fragile. Um, it, you know, allowed us to keep a lot of people alive longer, but they accumulated chronic conditions. So in the US, we have upwards of 45% of the population has at least one chronic condition that they're dealing with according to the CDC. So um, in that kind of population, old and sick, when you start to get to try to get to the 80 to 95% immunity level required for herd immunity, it gets really deadly very quickly. So I did the calculations on, on what it would require best case for the United States is that we have upwards of two to two and a half million people would die from the virus in order to achieve herd immunity because it would have to impact the at-risk populations in order to achieve it. Uh, that would be running the current levels at five to 15,000 people a day dead for a couple hundred days. Yeah, that's not going to happen. That's politically not palatable. Correct. Uh, at, uh, even, and the other, of course, even though people point out uh, some of the more hardcore herd immunity people that uh, the actual number of lost productive years will be surprisingly small uh, because the typical person who actually dies is like uh, 78 years old and has an estimated two years of life. Uh, left. Nonetheless, uh, you know, politically and from a humanitarian perspective, that just isn't going to fly at all, particularly if the alternative is something 
you know, in the 200,000 deaths range. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, I think I agree with you. So my intuition was correct to uh, act as if lockdown was the right strategy. That's good to hear. Yeah, I mean, in places like India, I mean, the population over 65 is six percent. It's tiny. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's herd immunity is possible. It will burn itself out. You know, go RO less than one pretty quickly because I mean, there's just so many young people that it runs into that it doesn't really have an impact on. Um, yeah, and the, the life expectancy is short there, so the number of people that are 80 with compounded uh, uh, complicating factors is small too, right? Uh, yeah. So and so that's where the real death, that's where the real harvest comes, you know, late 70s onward with uh, complications. Oh, yeah, by no, the way, I just looked up on the internet, the uh, median age in Sweden is 41.1. Right. So uh, probably not a good place to be running the herd immunity experiment. Correct. Unless you're, unless you're a little fascist, you're trying to cleanse the body, the national body, and make it, make it a little bit stronger yeah. you know, with less, less dead weight. But that's, uh, yeah, like in Germany, for instance, you know, 40, I think 48% of the people that have died are over 80. You know, and so that's, it, and that's typical. Like seventy-eight is the uh, best guesstimate of in the West at where the uh, uh, average age of fatalities will be. Right, and so it's it's interesting that you know a strength gets turned into a weakness, um, you know, and it makes herd immunity impossible. Which is usually, you know, the, at a gut level, this is kind of what the way we've handled respiratory pandemics in the past. You know, we've let herd immunity take care of it um, because we're younger and healthier, and it and it you know, allowed us to do so. But um, yeah, it doesn't work now. The, the, the quarantine strategy that China followed doesn't really work either. Um, I mean, because it's just so deleterious there. It's so negative in terms of its impact on the economy. And you keep that fragility in place, even though you kind of externalize the quarantine, meaning that if you can eradicate it internally, then you have to shut down your borders in order to prevent any, any new virus from uh, you know, entering back in. Um, already, the Chinese have lost what? They're running at a negative 7%, according to this morning's figures, for their economy. Well, so the first so time it's gone negative in 50 years, according to Chinese stats. Yeah, ours is likely to go down uh, minus 30, probably, by the end of the second quarter. So put that in comparison. Yeah, I think, they're, I think they were, uh, you know, this is Chinese stats, right? And they increased their death toll by 50% too. Um, but uh, it's not, uh, it's still, you know, radically understating the actual negative impact. But, it, you know, quarantine strategy really isn't a, you know, a good long-term strategy, particularly if we don't develop a vaccine or effective treatment for a coronavirus. It's kind of like, you know, you know solving the common cold to a certain extent. Uh, we haven't been able to do that for years and ever, really. And, um, and we may not get that with this. So that leaves only one strategy left. And this is the one I'm working on today is a, I call it the big tech solution. And um, the reason I call it big tech is that it's, you know, kind of a testing, case tracking, monitoring solution. But the only way you scale it, particularly to a population as big as we have in the U.S., is through tech. And the key thing to that, the cornerstone to that, the thing that they actually could turn our population, make, it's like adding a network decision-making system, kind of taking the consensus and articulating it with technology and then saying, okay, we can turn our population into something smart enough that this virus, this pandemic isn't a problem anymore. I mean, it's like an annoyance. And to do that, you would need to do um, in-home medical monitoring, use the smartphones for monitoring, uh, uh, you know, a lot of big data and individual decision-making systems built in uh, to get control of the information environment regarding health, regarding a transmission of, of a virus in this virus, uh, and, and combine that with state level hiring of case trackers and people to handle the monitoring and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it, that kind of effort could pull off a, you know, a long-term solution that actually allows us to, to operate as if we didn't, um, weren't even threatened by the virus anymore, weren't, weren't even threatened by the pandemic. Uh, but the big problem with that, obviously, is that the, the, we have almost zero trust in any effort to aggregate data. Um, you know, we've lost that trust. 
It's funny, I don't, because I, I worked in the direct mail business in the 90s, and I realized by 1996, with, with the data aggregators had, Axiom, et cetera, uh, there is no privacy, so fuck it, right? Just go, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, it, privacy, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's all hung up on this idea that, uh, you know, we've been, you know, strip mined for data by the, the big tech companies, and then before that, the, the direct marketing companies for, for decades. We don't have any trust in any of those companies to provide, to do right by us regarding the data. And we've kind of treated data, you know, which is one of the most valuable resources in the, in the world. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a product of, of you. You're, it's like a piece of your labor um, as something that's valueless. I mean, it's valued by all the companies that can grab it, but um, our only solution to it is to treat it, you know, to apply privacy to it, which is really just destroying the value of it. And the, uh, what we need to kind of get over this lack of trust in the government and lack of trust in corporations is this idea that you actually own your data. Yeah, that's clearly the right answer, right? Personally, I would sell all my health data for $5, right? Because I believe that health data is more beneficial to the commons than the privacy of it is worth to me, right? But yeah. other, other people might make that different decisions, and it doesn't really matter. Uh, and that's the key thing about the dance on the backside of this curve, is you don't need data from 100% of the people. You need statistically valid sampling data. And it may well, on a population of, uh, let's say, uh, at the state level, three or four million, uh, you may need a few thousand people providing high fidelity data to give you a sense of the uh, the native incidence rate and, and have the powers that be be able to respond forcibly to a local flare up. So the idea of uh, personal ownership of the data and voluntary opting in for a consideration uh, and then licensing to the common wheel for maybe for only a specific use, only say to uh, some consortium of uh, Apple, Microsoft, and Google who is uh, uh, doing monitoring for COVID. And oh, by the way, uh, this grant has a time to live of one year. Uh, and if you violate it, there's a $250,000 penalty, right? Uh, something like that would make great sense. And then you'd, uh, then if some people want to be paranoid about their data, let them. Uh, let those of us who are more realists about privacy and the relative benefits of uh, at least some uh, data in the commons, opt that way. And then we'd get a clear signal and it would make managing this uh, uh, very, very uh, practical. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a way to kind of accelerate it, though. I mean, I've been pushing kind of because of the scale of the crisis, this emergency UBI kind of thing. But if we change that to kind of like uh, a kind of a pandemic response payment, you know, a thousand bucks a month for contributing the data, to, for participation, to do the individual health monitoring, the kind of, you know, temperature checks on a daily basis, all the stuff that you'd opt in with using the smartphone, you get 90, 95% participation rates and you'd get data down to such a granular level and it would be going in and you get paid for it. And it would set expectations that you would actually get paid for your data. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, let's talk briefly about UBI and then and one other very interesting topic. Uh, you and I both like UBI, I think, in concept, but the more I've thought about it in respect to this particular uh, pandemic, the less I'm convinced that an ongoing UBI is the right answer, at least in the form it's currently being implemented, which is as a uh, electronic transfer to your checking account. Because we go back to the uh, 2008 financial crisis, uh, we found that then more than 70 percent of those stimulus checks, I think was it twice they were sent out, uh, ended up going into people's savings, which makes sense. You know, when, uh, when the system seems under stress, when uncertainty is high, uh, those people who have jobs and have at least a little financial buffer uh, will tend to add net liquidity to savings. Uh, and that's indeed uh, what I expect will happen with this one. So 70% of this large amount of money is essentially wasted. It's not truly wasted because it has a little bit of impact on behavior, but not much. Uh, and as you know, you've heard me say before, that if we could send these things out as debit cards that had a time to live of 45 days, and if you didn't spend the money on the debit card in 45 days, it evaporated back into the treasury's pool of money to be reallocated uh, the following month, then I think uh, a UBI could be very stimulative to the economy. But since no one seems to be running with this debit card idea, uh, probably the smarter thing to do is massively augment unemployment checks. Maybe just increase them by 50% or 100%. Because uh, while yeah, they're a doing lot, that. 
Yeah, well, they're, I don't, are they doing the, an actual, uh, I know they're extended the term, they, and I think in some places they're upping. But anyway, that's where all the money should go. It shouldn't go into UBI unless you can find a ha way to have it have a time to live so it gets spent into the economy and not just saved. Uh, much better, because uh, most people, well, a lot of people, a huge number, a, a tragic number of people have lost their jobs and will continue to lose their jobs over the coming uh, 45 days or so. The vast preponderance of people still have their jobs, probably 80%. Uh, so they don't really need the UBI. In fact, uh, we're, frankly, we're probably all financially, but we still have our jobs or our sources of income, uh, are actually better off because we're spending a shitload less, right? Uh, think about how much money people wasted going out to restaurants and bars. You know, uh, I remember when I was uh, 29 years old, it was a non-trivial percentage of my total income. Uh, you know, currently we're at home eating beans and rice. So uh, people's expenditure has gone down. Their income. 80% of people's incomes haven't, of employed people. Uh, so there's really not a need for a UBI. But let's focus it all, unless we can have uh, time to live, let's focus it on the unemployed. Yeah, I, you know, I found that there, our response, at least the, the bureaucratic government response to this crisis has been been terrible. Because I think it, it, the scale of it, the time frames um, are so short, the scale is so large uh, that they have really just flubbed it. They just uh, even you know the complete bipartisan cooperation can't get it done. I mean that two and a half trillion, four, actually four and a half of you taking all the money. Uh, relief bill was an example of just total disaster. I mean, yeah, shit, it, no. the rules welfare. weren't simple. Yeah. Oh yeah, and the, the SBA stuff. I mean, I mean the Small Business Association. I mean, what ninety six percent of small businesses didn't get anything. I mean, it was raided by the big companies. Uh, it, it just wasn't thought out. It, you know, they tried to make it nuanced. They tried to make all, all the nuance they try to add to this from the means testing to the, the conditionality is just working against them. And this is why I like, like focus on a, a, a very simple solutions that work. This is a whole network disaster and we need a whole network response. We need to reboot the whole thing. And the thing with the UBI is that, you know, the bottom or the top 10% don't need it, granted, and they, they won't, wouldn't need it afterwards either. Um, they're going to do fine. It's the bottom 90% and, and more than half of them supposedly have no savings. Um, and what this does is that it isn't an income replacement. It's taking off some of the sting and it allows you to borrow for short-term needs because you have a kind of a, you know, ongoing payment that can be borrowed against probably a pretty reasonable terms. And um, it allows you to plan for the future. I mean, it, it is, you know, once things, you know that this money's coming in and you get a job and it's supplementing your income and you get a big boost in your income, uh, you know, for the, for the, at a thousand bucks a month in a, you know, two income earner family, uh, that's upwards of a, of a 50% in improvement over their, the median income for the country. It would be, it would be a big boom. Um, and people could plan against it. They would spend the money. They would uh, feel more confident uh, I, you know, I think the, the big psychological effects at the network scale are, are, are going to be uh, extremely important in terms of us getting out of it because, you know, in the previous crisis, uh, in the financial crisis, it took forever to get out of the kind of siege mentality that, that we had due to that, due to that event. And that was a much smaller event than this. Uh, you know, I don't want to spend a decade crawling out of a depressionary economy. Um, I mean, cause it, the social cohesion factors alone are going to be uh, extremely dire. Yeah, I agree uh, with you there. And, and, uh, and certainly I think we're both exactly on the same page that the team red team blue shit show of the, of the stimulus was nearly as bad as they could make it. You know, the Dems demanded gover uh, money for government. Uh, oh yeah. That'll be really useful. Right. Uh, and then yeah. uh, the Republicans basically oh, the cool lobbied, for, lobbied for corporate welfare. So uh, both of them are wrong. Yeah. Yeah. The, the cool thing about a consensus and dissent framework is, is that makes it really different from the old left, right framework that you used to have. Um, the left, right, we usually, you know, big government, small government values associated with each. Uh, the consensus dissent framework is detached from specific policies or detached from specific value sets. Um, the consent can form around anything. <laughs> yep. no, and the dissent can form we, we around need to whatever's it. opposite can 
can do it. Yeah, we need to though, give those. Uh, now, maybe the right answer uh, is the problem is the network doesn't have its levers on power directly, right? Wouldn't it be clever if uh, you know that somehow the network and the descent both could allocate the stimulus money, for instance, right? Uh, something like my liquid democracy ideas, where uh, you know people vote how they want to vote, they proxy to people who know more than they do, and then uh, you know let's say the dollars are at the end of the day allocated by the number of votes that uh, you know, final leaf level proxy holders hold and they caucus and they choose uh, things to spend the money on. Something like that would be very interesting. But you know, today the network, descent, the network and the dissent is not directly coupled to the levers of power. Not uh, to which, political power, yeah. But it, I mean, it shut down the U.S. economy. It did. <laughs> and it's going to it keep it shut down until it decides that it wants to, you know, to release it. Um, the state and the... Uh, the states and the and the federal government really can just cajole them, can make their arguments in favor of of, of easing up, but the network is going to make the final decision. It's yeah, the most like powerful it. thing, and then they, you know, they, the federal government couldn't shut shut down the economy. I mean, even if it tried, I mean, it, it just could not do it as quickly and as effectively as the as the uh, consensus did. Yeah, and in fact, this actually reminds me of a 1960s saying by the uh, you know the new left radicals, which was uh, "vote with your feet." Uh, in their sense, they were saying, "quit your job and go become a hippie." Essentially, in this case, people voted with their feet by not going to work, uh, not going uh, shopping, and not getting on airplanes. It's kind of very cool uh, that we happen to be in a uh, decision frame where we could actually uh, vote with our feet. And it might be useful to think about uh, other scenarios where voting with your feet is is viable. Let's move on to my last topic here. We just got yep. a few minutes. Uh, which, to my mind, one of the most interesting things that's happened in the uh, as we start approaching the peak here and soon to the managing the backside of the curve is the emergence of these state regional compacts. Uh, as the way uh, to aggregate learning and coordination on the uh, gradual reopening. I got to say, it's like Churchill said uh, in his history of World War II, that he hadn't had a good night's sleep from May 1940 until December 7th, uh, 1941 uh, at Pearl Harbor, uh, where he knew World War II had just been won by the Allies. Uh, I had a similar reaction the day the uh, two compacts were announced. I said, holy shit, uh, maybe we will actually do a tolerable job of reopening the country in a nuanced, regionally sensitive, uh, data-driven, scientific fashion, uh, rather than uh, relying on the shit show in Washington. Uh, what are your thoughts on these uh, regional compacts and what might they mean for the future? Well, um you know, one of the ways that decision-making systems handle uh, threats that they can't handle <laughs> is that they decentralize. They, you know, the, in this case, the level of governance that actually is effective, it, you know, was found uh, at the state level and at, I guess, at the uh, the regional uh, block level. In terms of what they're doing, I mean, they're sharing information, sharing resources, but, you know, they may uh, accrue power, you know, over time, um, remember they're extra constitutional, so there is a kind of an open loop element here. If it lasts a long time, and these are you know these uh, blocks prove effective, we can see you know a lot of power accumulating in them, um, and it may change you know uh, the way the nation is run. I mean, they're all around you know fifty to sixty million people, uh, which is seems to be kind of a more effective level of of, of uh, you know, where the government actually can, can make effective decisions, um, you know, over 300 million, it becomes just too complex a problem given the, the, the speed and, and scale at which these network threats emerge. There was also a layer that I was surprised that no one seemed, well, maybe it's because they don't understand the way the dynamics of the stuff works, is that there was a, there maybe even still is an opportunity to kind of grab the baton on the consensus a bit. But it has to, you know, it's like running a kind of a daily program um, focused on specific things that we can all do, do together. I mean, there's lots and lots of uh, spare capacity in the consensus to get things done. Um, kind of a kind of an open source manager, so to speak, who focuses on tangible near-term steps that can be taken in order to uh, achieve the end goal is eradication of the pandemic. And... Um, you know, not, a, not any of the, you know, the standard political elements, uh, anything that's divisive, just 
focusing on things that, you know, everyone can agree on because it achieves that goal. Yeah, like for instance, our local makerspace, which I uh, helped get started, uh, is working on its own in coordination with the two local hospitals uh, to build face shields, uh, build them by right. the thousands, right? Yep. Uh, there ain't no politics involved there. This is basically pure grassroots, a community of makers who have uh, access to some amazing tools, uh, uh, figured out. Uh, first, they did some prototypes, sent them over to the hospital, said, no, not quite right. What we really need is this. And uh, within a week, the makers figured out what the hospitals need, uh, bought uh, some materials, and they're stamping them out by the thousands, right? Uh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, that could also, that all could be brought to a national level. I mean, you look at the White House briefing, and it's about marshalling the, the federal resources or not marshalling the federal resources to solve the problem, but kind of like a counter programming, maybe live on YouTube for an hour every day uh, where you have some kind of celebrity MCs that kind of, not celebrities from Hollywood, but you know, maybe political talent that that's willing to kind of step into the space that in a relatively non-political way. And then kind of MC uh, an hour or two of, you know, hi highlighting specific projects that like the one you mentioned and bringing it to a national scale and uh, monitoring its progress and, and telling people what they can do, you know, and to contribute and to get get things done um, and it could even be information discovery you know <laughs> you know what what new information do we need in order to make more effective decisions and having 10 or 20 million people working on it can get it solved really really quickly and it's a it's a resource that we haven't really tapped into and it, it, it could be you know if you could you know somebody moved into that space it, it could yield a, a incredible amount of political power going forward Damn great idea, people. So uh, uh, social entrepreneurs out there who have a, a decent uh, followership on YouTube or something, let's run, with, let's run with this idea. Let me know. I'll help promote it. I'll help you bring in guests and commentators and, uh, and things like that. Uh, I think that's a great idea. And, you know, there's, there's just like I can just see it now. There's a vacuum waiting for this to happen. Somebody ought to do this, whether it will happen right now or not, because of the time uh, is hard to say, but it ought to. Yeah, I agree. It, well, that's just a, an opportunity that they would have been better filled if it was done last month when people were still scrambling. Um, exactly. But it's still, though the still backside, valuable now. Though I will point out, and this is one of the things I've been hitting regularly, is managing the backside of the curve is going to be a shitload harder than managing the front side. As it turned out, there was one brute force rubber hammer that worked, which was social distancing, period. Really, that's the right. only thing that worked. Uh, and if it hadn't been for that, the whole medical system would have been overrun. Sort of their weak ass uh, response on ventilators and PPEs would not have even come close to do the job. So a, uh, a D minus job on mobilization uh, uh, in terms of equipment and protocols, et cetera, was saved by one big brute force hammer. Uh, there is not a brute force hammer on the backside of the curve. It's a very nuanced and sophisticated dance. And so the need for these things may actually be greater on the backside than there was on the front side, as it turned out. Right. Yeah, I, that's the backside. The exit strategies are tough. And that's why I'm leaning towards the big tech thing. It's uh, the two other solutions are too brutal. Um, and it, it makes the fragile kind of developed countries ambulatory for the next, you know, decade. <laughs> I, I can't see us getting out of it. I mean, unless there's something out of the blue tech fix in terms of vaccine or treatment, it's absolutely brutal unless we kind of a, adopt the, the big tech fix, as I Although, outlined earlier. There is one other one, which I actually think is worth considering, uh, which is the Paul Romer insane level of testing fix. Uh, which could be, the two could be combined. Paul Romer, the Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, has done some very interesting modeling, which says if we do, the number sounds insane, 22 million tests a day. Right. Uh, so, so every adult gets tests every two weeks. Uh, and that there was essentially instantaneous contact tracking and quarantining uh, on the backside of that, maybe publicly paid quarantining at uh, hotels, which will still be underutilized for a long period of time, then we could get back to pretty close to normal 
more or less instantly. It might take us three months to ramp up to that level of testing if we made a uh, World War II level of commitment to it. Uh, but that's well, the thing I like about it. It doesn't require any new computer systems. It doesn't require anybody to cooperate. Uh, it's a very brute force. It makes it cooperate the level. Well, if you want to keep your job, you have to be tested at work, right? Uh, not coercive, but uh, pretty damn per persuasive. Or not mandatory, but pretty damn persuasive. Uh, and when I, when I look at the things that need to be done, uh, brute force, just like social distancing, uh, has a big plus, which is that it can be executed by the morons who run our, uh, our systems. There's some problems with it, obviously, because, I mean, that's the kind of thing you have to do every day, potentially for a decade. I mean, this is a pandemic and it's not going to go away globally. It's going to keep on coming back. And we're even having problems now getting beyond the 150,000 tests a day level. So, um, I mean, they're automating it and then, the, you know, that will allow us to reach higher levels, but that's an incredible amount of scale. Uh, yeah, there's and no doubt about it. But data about is easier. Well, look at World War II. How many fucking tanks did we build? Took us a while to ramp up, but we were putting them damn things out every few minutes, right? Uh, but I think we have to think about all these. Yeah, I, will, I agree. Uh, I will say that I, you know, having done IT development at very large scale uh, during much of my career, uh, you know, anything that requires a lot of data, a lot of data processing, user interfaces, et cetera, it takes a fuckload longer than you think to make right. it bulletproof, et cetera. And it might actually be ramping up testing. I don't think you need 22 million a day, but say 5 million a day, uh, maybe actually done much more faster and we'd be robust. Well, anyway, John, as always, incredibly interesting conversation here, which I hope our audience will appreciate and i'll remind people to check john out at global gorillas on patreon put a few uh, alms in his cup so he can continue doing his work and uh let's do this again soon all right jim thanks production services and audio editing by jared james consulting music by tom muller at modernspacemusic.com